Good morning. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to welcome you in the name of EFG to our today's panel on the food revolution. My name is Lawrence Altrek, and I'm heading sustainability at EFG Bank. And first, I would like to introduce our valuable speakers. We have Sofia Condes. Sofia is Investor Outreach Manager at FAIR Initiative. FAIR stands for Farm Animal Investment Risk and Return. And she is passionate about the role of finance in improving food systems and global health. Very warm welcome. Then we have, to my right, Christoph Jenny. He is founder of Planted, a Swiss company producing alternative proteins with the goal of creating alternative animal meat. He wants to work for animal welfare and stop global climate change. Next to him, we have Dr. Martin Sonnefeld. He is executive director of the World Food System Center and lecturer at ETH Zurich. Martin is as well president of the Swiss National Food and Agricultural Organization Committee and exco member of the Swiss Food and Nutrition Valley. Then we have Sam Glover. He is portfolio manager at EFG Asset Management with focus on European and ESG equity strategies and is responsible for FCOM's investments in the food value chain. And last but not least, we have Stefano Montobio. He is Global Head of Investment Governance and ESG at EFG Asset Management. Besides working activities, he gives lectures on sustainable finance and is chairman of CENPRO uh, Foundation. Now, the food system is broken. Looking at the population, there are shocking numbers in regard to massive obesity and at the same time a very high rate of undernutrition. The population is growing, but a healthy nutrition is not ensured. In the same time, the food industry is far off of being sustainable. One third of the food produced is wasted, and animal agriculture is responsible for a large part of climate change and the use of our resources. Looking at the food value chain, it is clear. Complexity is immense. So today, we first would like to talk about the challenges and opportunities of the global population and nutrition needs, and the food industry and the new technologies, including distribution challenges. We secondly would like then to talk about the important role of science and regulatory frameworks and governance in order to steer the food industry. And last but not least, we would like to talk about investment opportunities and financing needs. However, we should never forget the main participants in this value chain. It's all about people. Their life reality, their habits and culture. Starting now with the global population. Population will grow, so the need for food. Land and water, however, is scarce. Is this an impossible task? I would like to start with Stefano. Thank you, Lawrence. Well, it's not an impossible task, but uh, it's not an easy one either. Um, population, we are now seven and a half, eight billion people, will be uh, around 10 billion by mid of the century, will be 11 billion by the end of, uh, of the century, according to UN estimates. Uh, population, uh, so on the one hand, we have to increase food availability for all the people. On the other, we know that uh, food uh, and the food chain from agriculture to fork is responsible for roughly one-third, 30% of the emission. So we have to grow food to increase food availability, but we have to slash emission. So all the food chain is full of uh, conflicting requirements, often contradictory. We might think we have to increase land, but we, we cannot increase deforestation. We might think we, we need to increase, to, to improve water availability, but already today, 25% of rivers run dry before reaching the ocean. We have issue with, uh, with the topsoil. In, uh, the, we are losing topsoil thickness. Topsoil is the, the portion of the soil that is the rich of nutrients uh, and the organic matter. But uh, as a consequence of increased rains and exploitation, uh, we are approaching in some regions 
uh, a thickness of the soil that is uh, going to reduce uh, the productivity. We, cannot, we have to increase productivity, but we cannot use uh, usual fertilizer based on phosphorus or nitrogen because the science tells us that we are already beyond the borders of the, or the boundaries of, uh, of safety. And then, uh, as, as, Lauren, as Lawrence already mentioned, we have also to reduce waste. In Europe, we throw away one-third of, of food. It's 170 kilos each. If you have to, to imagine, it's more or less uh, only for Europe, covering the Lake of Garda with rotten foods for all the surface. So just to give you, to contextualize a bit the, the number, it's, it's huge. So a lot of challenges, but also a lot of uh, possible solution. But there's a lot of things we have to tackle. Thank you very much, Stefano. I think uh, on the same time, we have the food challenges, and then we have the reality of malnutrition. So Martin, can you give me a little bit more insight in what, what the problems are? And I think as well globally, the differences are highly diverse. Thank you, Lawrence, and I'm happy to, to follow what Stefano said. With all the challenges we face, I guess population growth is one, one driver, but not the only one. And there are very many interlinkages in between. So if we look at food security and, and the situation of malnutrition, we, we should have an eye on, on the triple burden of malnutrition, which means an undersupply of calories and uh, macronutrients, but at the same time, um, many people around the globe suffer from micro macronutrient deficiency. And as third, we have uh, high numbers of overweight and obesity, not only in the global north, but across the world. So in 2019, I think uh, a recently um, publication on, on the situation of nutrition, they came up with the figure of around one-fourth of global population experienced either hunger or had not adequate access to nutrient-rich food. So we should not only talk about calories and food, but we should also talk about nutrition in, in a way. And that's where the link to population is then also. That population growth is one driver of the, the situation regarding food insecurity and malnutrition, but we have not only the sheer growth, but also demographic aspects, cultural aspects, as you mentioned. We have, a, we have a vast diversity of how we eat. And what you see here behind me is just one example of a, the Eat Lancet report <coughs> on food and planetary health. And they came up with a suggestion of a planetary health diet. And that's kind of the health boundary you see in the red circle. And you see just two examples from Sub-Saharan Africa and North America, where population in exceeds these, these boundaries to a certain degree. And what is very obvious at one, one view also is that we lack uh, nutrition diversity, which is the underlying kind of or, or guarantee for adequate uh, nutrition and also for kind of resilience towards many health issues around the globe. So what we have to kind of, what I, what we also from science more and more um, kind of suggest is to take a system perspective on these challenges. Taking away a pure population focus, taking away a pure production focus, but try to tackle the issue uh, more broadly, which allows us to then make links to the local context. So have an eye on availability, on the accessibility, the affordability of nutrient-rich food, and of course then also the desirability for nutrient-rich food. And there are measures needed on all these different tracks. Thank you very much. Would you like to add something, Chris, on, on that topic? Um, <clears throat> no, I think Martin said it pretty well. I think what I would emphasize if you want to do this uh, shift is that price, we need to meet price. So <clears throat> if you look at that map, it has to very much to do with price. People need to afford protein. So if you find a solution, we cannot find a solution for us just here uh, in a Western wealthy country uh, such as Switzerland is, but we need to find a global solution that works for everyone. So I think the price consciousness and how we convert proteins um, into food uh, for people is core. 
That leads us directly to the next topic. I would like to talk about the challenges of the current food industry. So what are the current pillars and supply chains that are currently working and where do you see the, the major challenges for that? Well, the, the key part where I think it got broken is basically we have um, a population um, that is uh, going to hit probably 10 billion people by 2050. Um, we start to eat more and more wheat, meat per capita. Um, at the same time, we have 76% of agricultural land being used uh, by livestock. So um, if you make or try to add this up, it's not going to work out. So in that sense, I think it's very key that in our supply chain, we don't feed the proteins anymore to animals and then eat the animals. But So we skip the animal and fix the supply chain in that sense that we're much more efficient in converting proteins into something that humans eat. So I think it's a very much a human-driven issue where we need to get the end consumer in the end who eats meat to find another solution that is better than meat. And that's what we're working on. That's one aspect of the supply chain. Maybe, Sam, you can, uh, in, in an, on a general basis, uh, tell us the overall value chain is not only the production, is as well many other aspects. So what are, in general, the, the, the main challenges of other aspects within mm. this value chain? That's right, yes. So, I mean, when we're thinking about the food industry from an investment opportunity set, but also looking at the entire food value chain, we typically split it into three different segments. So upstream, essentially your food production, so at the agricultural level. Then the midstream, we call that the distribution section. So essentially that's thinking about packaging of the food, transportation of the food, and then at the final end, the actual consumer-facing businesses. And there's challenges at all three of those different segments. Um, but likewise, we also see opportunities to improve throughout that value chain. And the main challenges that we see day-to-day -day throughout that supply chain is around greenhouse gas emissions, carbon emissions. And you know, to give you a, a, an example, for instance, a traditional supermarket business model in developed worlds, these were supply chains that were developed in many cases over 50 years ago and haven't really changed over that period or adapted. And so you can imagine in many cases these are incredibly complex, convoluted, and as a result produce unnecessary carbon emissions, which can be streamlined. And we have a number of exciting examples to share with you of, of innovative business models that are um, disrupting this supply chain to make it more carbon efficient. And then the other side, which Stefano and the other speakers alluded to as well, is waste throughout the chain. So as Stefano said, essentially a, th a third of food that is produced for human consumption never actually makes it to the table. And there's a huge opportunity there to improve that. About the distribution, we talk a little bit later. What I really would like to know as well, everybody talks about the emission issue and about the use of land. I, before, uh, I was not really aware how substantial that is, not only the emission part, not only CO2 and methane from cows, but as well the use of land in order to produce actually the food for the animals and so on, and, and the loss of the almost... Uh, 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 a majority of, of, of jungles and trees and so on. So can you elaborate a little bit more on, on, on figures that we facing and that the people realize what, what's all about? Yeah, thank you, Lawrence. So I, I think that when we speak about an, the animal protein sector, that's where there's uh, a lot of resources that are used to produce a huge amount of animals every year. And that's why we need to pay... Uh, really a lot of attention to make sure that we are uh, looking at what that means in terms of not only the resources that we use, but also the waste and pollution that comes from, from that uh, process. So every year we are processing about 72 billion land animals. This means, and, I'm, and I specify land animals because I'm not even speaking about uh, fish and seafood. This means that we have, uh, I mean, the population of those animals that are only used for human consumption is about 10 times the amount of humans that we have in the world. Those animals generate a huge amount of waste that is very concentrated in the areas where they are produced and processed. That waste means that instead of like the normal animal cycle of animals grazing and kind of like regenerating the soil, 
they are concentrated in factories, and that waste ends up concentrated in some specific areas. It goes to the rivers, it goes to the ocean. Uh, we now have uh, new data that is coming out of a report we're publishing today that shows just what that means in terms of risk to biodiversity. And then I think there is a whole other issue, which is that to produce those animals, we're not producing them in a very, let's say, natural way. We give them a lot of additives, and we also use a lot of antibiotics to be able to produce those animals, more than what we use for human health. So about 73% of antibiotics consumed globally are actually consumed by farm animals. Those antibiotics are also ending up in our water streams and are ending up in our soil. So this is a huge issue that needs to change now because we the reality is that we won't be able to actually um, have an environmental balance with those quantities of waste and pollution coming out of just one industry. Again, I think we've already touched on uh, greenhouse gas emission. We've spoken about deforestation. But I think it is, I mean, and I think what the visual shows is that when we speak about food categories, there is a specific issue when it comes to from some of the animal source foods that we're consuming that needs to change. And we have some ideas about how that can change, but it involves really a lot of working in harmony with these companies to give them the right incentives to actually transform the way that they're producing that meat and also to diversify, because the reality is that there's just not enough land in the world for all of us to consume the amounts of meat that we see right now consumed in high income countries. I see, yes, and um, there are a lot of targets set as well in the world, you know, if we talk about COP26 and what has been again discussed and defined, so maybe the output is quite minimal, but target setting is easy, but then to implement is another story. And I think there are too many targets and sustainability measurements around that at the end are really not tangible or too long term or as well misleading. So I like to comment on Monday on, on the summit in the morning during the, these panels, somebody said, the complexity of measurement led to an unintended consequence of confusing people. And I think this is a right sentence because finally, yes, achieving net zero by 2050, what does it mean? And what concrete terms can we do now for the next years? And this is, the, I think, the difficult thing for the population to understand because the case of urgency is just not really tangible. So my first question to Martin is, how do you see this and what could be more tangible targets for the food uh, transition that we just heard, what, what problems uh, and challenges we are facing? Thank you, Lawrence. What a question. Um, for, first of all, we have targets for sustainable food systems. These are the SDGs. The SDG 2, end hunger and uh, achieve food security, improved nutrition, that's actually a target. The problem is it's not so tangible and it's not so measurable and probably the bigger problem is that it is interlinked with many different other SDGs and many different um, other other kind of elements of the system. For example, if we want to increase or end hunger Historically, the societal answer to it was to try to increase yields, increase productivity. And that leads then to many other challenges also addressed by other SDGs. It's a bit less than going to a CO2 target, which is also universally applied and, and easy, easier comparable. With food systems, we have the challenge that it's highly context specific. I agree on the high footprint of animal production, but on the other side, we should not, and we haven't met yet, we haven't um, talked about the, the most important actors of the food systems, the farmers yet. They have often animals also in terms of kind of as a risk strategy. It's a, it's a very important element for their livelihoods and their, their also ability to, to cope with, with stresses from the environment. So I agree there is a lot to do in terms of animal production. I fully agree that there is an urgent need to reduce 
um, consumption of animal production, but on the other hand, there are also there is a space in between that we try to improve the way we we raise these animals for um, livestock, for example, we know that grazing, as you mentioned it, that's probably a way to reduce the negative impact of um, livestock production, but on the other hand also allow for making use of natural resources such as grassland where you hardly can grow anything else. Switzerland is a perfect example for it. Imagine to grow crops in the Alps, that's going to be quite difficult and then even disastrous with all the erosion, which would then be the cause, just as a as a one one example. The problem is that we are embedded in a in in a system which has a lot of interdependencies. So if we try to improve SDG two, we run the risk of getting more off track on on other SDGs. And um, yeah, maybe I leave it here because otherwise it's for a long time. No, but maybe we can continue on that topic because it might be as well a lack of motivation or uh, not sufficient economic incentive for farmers to change their production. Uh, so can you, Sophia, maybe as well uh, talk about that? And uh, there are one side is, is, is the farmer side and then the other side we have the big players, the production food companies. And there have been a lot of positive uh, um, uh, examples of engage of real engagement on that. And I think besides new technologies that we will talk later on, I think it is as well a question the big players need to change as well. The transition is not only on, on inventing new technologies because the current food production needs to really change as well. So maybe uh, I hand over to you. Yeah, thank you. So I think there's, I have some thoughts on that. I think first thing I want to mention is that it's really important not to demonize farmers. They have a very challenging work and especially smallholder farmers are working against very difficult conditions and, and are feeling are the first ones feeling some of the effects of climate change. Um, I think FAIR's vision is more about moving the big players that have a tremendous amount of influence in our food system and have far more resources to be able to adopt more sustainable practices. And the way that we do that is that we believe that investors have a unique voice as shareholders of most of uh, these huge companies and can encourage these companies to adopt better behavior and to be part of a transition towards more sustainable food system. So I think there's many ways to do that. So one way is to give investors more information. The more companies are transparent about the work that they do, their practices, uh, their emissions, etc., the more investors can actually kind of use that to influence their investment decision making. Another very important tool is investor engagement. So investor engagement with companies and having collaborative engagement, which means that a group of investors use their collective influence to actually encourage companies to change their behavior, I think that's a very powerful tool. And I think at FAIR, because we focus on the food system and especially on uh, making the protein value chain more sustainable, we have seen that it can exert change. So I think, for example, the exam uh, the, what you see here in the visual behind me is a very tangible example of using the collective influence of over 70 investors to actually push some of the largest restaurant chains to think about antibiotics as a public health risk, as a systemic risk, as an economic risk. And for in three years, we managed to get 20 of the companies that didn't even know they had anything to do with antibiotics or what was their role in generating antimicrobial resistance to actually embed that into the way they would work with their supply chain and to adopt an antibiotics policy. So again, I do want to kind of stress the role that investors can play if they decide to use their influence to exert uh, pressure on companies to do the right thing. But you said embedding antibiotics in their strategy. So what does it in concrete terms mean and what have they achieved so far? And what are the plans for the next years? Because I think this is in concrete terms. One is to realize, and the other thing is to make plans and then really to shift. Yeah. So how is the willingness there in, in that sense? 
Yeah, no, I think that's a really good question because I think as investors, you, you do want to get into the concrete. What is actually happening and what is, where is the change lying? So, for example, when we speak about antibiotics, uh, these are companies, really large companies like McDonald's, that have very complex supply chains. And if McDonald's starts to have an antibiotics lens in their supply chain and asks their providers of the inputs that they use to make these burgers that we see all around the world to minimize the use of antibiotics and to avoid using antibiotics for growth promotion, because antibiotics are fantastic tools that we have to treat disease. But if they are used for many other things that are not about treating disease, that are given to animals on a daily basis, that are used to compensate poor hygiene, or that are used to promote the rapid growth of animals, that is a very irresponsible use of antibiotics. So what we ask these companies is to draft the policy to say, how, what, how do we define responsible use of antibiotics? And to ensure that every single player in their supply, lay, in their supply chain was either sticking to that policy or was no longer going to be able to be a supplier of companies like McDonald's. And maybe I need to stick to that question because I think that's interesting. Um, how about the geographical differences? Because I think for a Western European well-equipped farmer, it's sort of easy to change. Mm -hmm. But if we look on the basics of, of farming systems across the globe as well in emerging markets, I mean, they do not have that many options to change and, and they, are, they are needed to use these fertilizers and other things. So. How is this addressed and how much percentage, if you look at now this example of McDonald's, how much percentage of the overall world production of their burgers is sort of attached to these new initiatives and what is still a long way going forward? Yeah, no, I think that I'm, I'm really happy that you asked that question because I think we need to be conscious that when we speak about corporate practices, we cannot assume that big companies uh, uh, have the same, well, that's very small companies, small farmers in different regions of the world have the same tool as some of these huge companies. I think what we're asking for here is that the largest companies that have most of the resources should set the gold standard. They have the responsibility to set the gold standard for what good corporate behavior should look like. When it comes to other regions where there's less of a favorable regulatory environment, that is, I think, where we need to have the government also step in and help enable some of the companies to do the right thing and redirect some of the subsidies that are currently used for industries that have a very negative impact in our health and in our environment to support some of those companies. That's why we speak about a just transition, is about how are we going to reallocate resources so that players in low middle income countries have the, the tools and the resources to actually also adapt to a changing world. So I think there, here we're speaking about the role of investors, which is a very important role. We're speaking about the role of companies, but I think it's really important also to speak about the role of governments and development banks, because they can use public funds to help that transition and to help the smaller play, players be able to adapt to some of these new requirements. Yes, we will address that topic specifically a little bit later on. Now, having talked about, let's say, the big players and what is ongoing in terms of engagement, um, there are really a lot of challenges. I think the, 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 the stage is set, the people are aware of what should be done, um, and the other part is new technology. I mean, one is the traditional food production that is improving, and on the other hand, it's a completely different story how to create new technologies in order to create alternative proteins. And this, I think they have several, I think the first alternative protein I had was corn. I really didn't like it at all, but I think it's something that we need. It's, it's, a, it's a very healthy protein, but I think uh, th there's a lot of uh, process and, and technology development. So, Chris, can you give us an overview on the current status of alternative proteins and uh, what are the different types and, and, and where do we stand? Yes, <clears throat> so corn I think is an amazing example. I think they've done something pretty cool um, very early on. Uh, probably be, did it before there was a market. So um, pretty cool. Also the tech sector that actually <coughs> uses not, 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 not uh, lacking of innovation, but I think then it's about uh, consumer adoption and uh, having a product market fit. 
And I think that's sort of where we are today. Um, you have the early on innovators, you call them. Uh, it's about 2.5% typically in any new market. that are willing to jump and they're willing to try things out, as you. You, you tried out corn, right? Uh, you gave it a shot and then uh, some of them stick and some of them don't. And that's sort of, I think, where we are. And now we need to ask ourselves as a whole industry, so how do we, how, how do we get to mass market? And I think there are three things that you've got to hit. One is taste. So I think nobody's willing to sacrifice taste over a long time of period. So if, if you don't hit taste, nobody's going to follow you. The second point is price. Um, we are in a very uh, good situation here in Switzerland, for example, but uh, globally that's different. So we've got to hit price and make sure that <clears throat> price-wise alternative proteins become cheaper than meat. And the third um, point, uh, which I, th I think is then also uh, really important uh, if you have a price and taste, that is that you have a technology that is more efficient. So the efficiency has to increase by a lot to meet uh, the challenges because we basically heard it, we're tapped out. There's not much more we can crank out. So every person that starts to eat uh, animal meat um, has a pretty big harm on the system. And that's, I think, where you see the different uh, technologies coming up. The early on uh, products are mostly based around structure. So you try to mimic or uh, replicate the structure. And now I think we're getting really into the point of how can we make this taste and feel the mouth feel from the juiciness to uh, the sort of fibrosity, if you bite into it, make that feel. But before coming to the substitution of meat, I mean, in terms of alternative proteins, there are different technologies, basic technologies. So that's plant-based, there is the animal cell-based. Can you elaborate a little bit on that and giving the, the overall structure on what is feasible so far? Yeah, <clears throat> then I'm probably going to be the, the, giving the lecture, <laughs> like Martin said, but I tried to do it really quick. So yes, the early on plant-based, uh, it's mostly extrusion-based. Um, you have a thing called dry extrusion, uh, where it's basically the same process as doing pasta. And then you have crumbles, and these crumbles you uh, mush together, and then you basically have a burger. So that's the first thing that you saw. Uh, then there's, there's a process called wet extrusion. Um, wet extrusion, you basically heat up the proteins, um, you let them unlink, and you relink them when you let them flow through a cooling dye. And the cooling dye does something very simple. Uh, on the edges, like on a river, uh, it flows less fast. You have a flow pattern, like a V-shape. If you do this right in a three-dimensional space, you get a fibrous meat-like structure. Um, then you have uh, the whole fermentation uh, platform. Uh, where you have traditional fermentation, uh, where you mostly uh, have uh, microbes, uh, like you have, for example, when you drink beer, right? You, you also drink a fermented product. Um, you have the whole uh, landscape of fermented uh, fermentation, where you have a lot of other capabilities, especially around taste. And then if you go from fermentation to precision fermentation, um, you do very specific things with cells, and then at some point you arrive at cell... But you, in between step is maybe single, single cell, um, which is also really in interesting around algae, where you have a single cell uh, that uh, produces something. And then the last part is the cell-based uh, that we also hear a lot these days, where you basically have an animal cell grow inside of a reactor. And uh, then you have probably 20 steps in between. And my conviction is, in the long run, it will be a combination of these approaches. So, as well, there are companies starting 3D printing stakes. And uh, so maybe, Sam, a question to you. Why do we actually substitute meat and not just create a new tasty protein? Because finally we don't need meat, we need protein. That's right. I mean, it's an incredibly interesting uh, space that um, we've just discussed in terms of the growth opportunity, um, you know, to, to provide you some figures. So in, in the US where um, alternative meats have perhaps had a little bit of a head start given the two major brands in that market, I'm sure you've all heard of Beyond Meat and Impossible. Um, they've seen some very substantial growth over the past few years. So, to, so they've over the past few years grown at a compound annualized growth rate of over 50%. Um, and now today, in the U.S. market, estimates put the penetration of alternative meats at around about 5% of the total meat market. 
Um, so, you know, clearly made some progress, but much more progress to be made. To give you some comparison on the alternative milk space, um, which is perhaps a few years ahead of alternative meats, the global penetration there is around about 15%. Um, so we feel there's a, a, there's a substantial growth pathway for the most successful alternative meat products. I see. And uh, as well there, the geographical differences of the taste. You know, everybody has a different culture, different habits, what they eat. So is this, at the end, the, the substitution of meat, is this the basic reason of the acceptance of the customer? Or how do you see that, Chris? Yeah, so I think uh, meat uh, has been sterilized to be something special uh, in culture. Um, I think it was a very rare good uh, 50 years ago, and um, now it became very, very mass market, maybe where you, where you had it two weeks, two days in a week in your diet. Uh, it's now seven days and maybe for two meals or three meals a day. Um, so it has a really strong cultural significance. So I think we need to start there and basically build a bridge um, to alternative structured proteins where the consumer feels at home, where they can use the recipes that they know from their grandma and uh, basically continue that tradition because I think consumer behavior around food is very traditionalist uh, in general mm -hmm. speaking. So it's a very conservative space. So in that sense, I think we need to build that bridge and that's why you see these early products um, typically have some kind of a link to a particular animal or a particular animal cut so the consumer understands what to do with it, how to prepare it, mm -hmm. and how to make it. But if you think about what you can do in the long run, probably it's going to be pretty crazy in a sense of that products uh, are going to be better than what we know today. But then it's really a question as well, how to, how to promote that? Because when I first tated, uh, tasted your <laughs> incredible product, imagining that it was chicken, I thought, so-so. But if I imagine it would be a different type of protein in, in a curry, it was really tasty. So I think it's, it's as well the, the, the question of perception, how to position it. But I think this is the first step of, of the consumers to have something they know uh, in order to, 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 to move forward. So um, where do you see then uh, the products in five to ten years? Is there something you can already imagine? Do we still substitute uh, uh, meat or have we completely different different way of eating. Yeah, so I hope you didn't hate it the first time. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. It's no, taste. no. Um, uh, yes, exactly. So I, th I think you have this um, very broad application space of meat. So if you think of what you can do with a piece of chicken, uh, there are like hundreds of ways to prepare it right. So we need to make sure that in every application you have the same success as you had with the curry. Um, which is obviously a huge challenge. With burgers, it's a little bit easier because you have basically one application. You put it on a grill and you put it uh, into a hamburger. Um, so we need to get broader, and that's, I think, what you start, we'll start to see with these products. Um, we will have traits and characteristics that are maybe better or clearly better, ultimately, than meat. So, yes, you will see structures that are much bigger, uh, so talking about whole cuts, so if we do a piece today uh, with the commercialized product, it's about yay big, and if you are in the science department, it's about yay big. So yeah. you, you, you will get bigger cuts of, piece, or, or of meat or, or entire huge chunks of meat that you then are completely uh, free to choose what you do with it. Uh, how do you slice it? How do you cut it down? So I think we'll see sort of a, let's call it form freedom uh, of products um, that are uh, extremely uh, or focused to, to take advantage of these new technologies. Because if you look at what a cell in an animal inside can do and how you change that maybe through breeding over hundreds of years, imagine if you have a completely new technology stack uh, to choose from, you can combine different technologies, you're able to do meat or meat-like structures that are completely different and have a new taste and profile. Yes, I think that's as well a, a question to, to Martin or Sophia. Looking at the, at, at the global production, I think at the end it's always a, a question of scalability and cost to produce this new type of, of proteins. And uh, another example as a similarity maybe is, is the introduction of, of, of the telephone. So in some areas in the world, they was just overjumping technologies from zero phone to cell phone rather having no fixed line. 
So how do you see the development of, of uh, and this goes then back to the global food nutrition needs and, 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 and local serving food uh, in, in a different way because uh, there are many areas on the, the globe where cows, even, even if they were there, they cannot grow because of the climate or whatever it is. So it's a completely different way of producing locally and feeding the, uh, the population. How do you, do you see some trends going in that direction or how? Maybe Sophia first. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's um, important to kind of restate that in, in many contexts, meat is still aspirational. And we want to try to think of a food system where it will be maybe meat in a different way that will be aspirational. So, for example, in the work that we do, kind of doing researching all the different trends in terms of the adoption of some of these alternative proteins, we're seeing a lot of encouraging work happening, for example, in Asia, where, of course, there's a huge population uh, of growing middle class and still this kind of aspirational aspect of, I want to get access to this kind of global brands, etc. We see that many of the companies that are providing solutions uh, and are providing alternative proteins are focusing on providing very desirable products for the Asian consumer that are more environmentally friendly. So, for example, when we speak about a company like Oatly, I mean, we can see some of these consumers in emerging markets leapfrogging from never knowing the cappuccino of Starbucks with milk, cow's milk, and only knowing the cappuccino with oat milk. We see a lot of the companies, that, a lot of the consumers that are still aspiring to the burger, maybe just transitioning to a plant-based burger. Um, and but I think it really has to be adapted to the regional taste and to what the consumer considers as desirable and aspirational. So we do see some trends there, but I still I still think that there there's a need uh, for more support to really like give for companies to become more transparent and also for the consumer to have more information about the impact of what they are choosing to eat. And also for some of the foods that maybe should have not existed in the way they exist today, and I think about when we speak about problems such as obesity, the 2,000 calorie milkshake or the $1 fried chicken, I wouldn't see those foods being there in the future, at least at the price point that they are, because it makes no sense for the cheapest calories to be the most harmful calories for human health and for the environment. So I think when we think about that transition and that potential for leapfrogging, I would really desire for that leapfrogging to avoid some of the mistakes that we have made in high-income countries. Um, and that's why we're trying to encourage companies to really think kind of more of in the next five to 10 years, where do you want to be? And do you want to be in the right side of history or do, I, do you want to stay stuck in old ways that have created a lot of problems in your current markets? Uh, but I'm sure Martin also has uh, uh, some really good ideas and suggestions of where, where he sees the trends heading next. Um, I think it's, it's, as Christoph mentioned, it's a combination of different approaches, which is probably the most promising. What we see also when we look back, we have more and more a kind of fragmentation of markets. We have different value chains of different qualities, like let's say organic is, is one closed line and we have other uh, qualities of these, these commodities. And I see that going further, this fragmentation of these different types. And then it's the role of innovative industry and science to somehow make best out of these combinations. That's one point. Another point which I was thinking of when you were talking, Sophia, was the the need for linking um, potential new products which are more sustainable also to the to the traditional food people know so um, for example the, the you, you, your basic ingredient is pea and now we do a lot of research in in how to grow peas also in Switzerland in a more sustainable way so we are kind of heading back behind, or we're running behind you in order to support also the the demand of the industry. So I guess that's that's very important to somehow link 
these different needs. And there, maybe my third point, if you allow, um, the third thing is, is really to have, um, to have a brave government which is able to deal with the complexity and with these different, different targets they face. I guess there is a, a huge need for, for policy coherence in that sense. Often the food system is addressed by many different ministries in parallel, which is devastating for really making progress. Because you have a, a Ministry of Health with good reasons promoting healthy uh, nutrition, and at the same time you have a Ministry of Agriculture with not less good reasons trying to promote agricultural production and increasing incomes for, for farmers, for example. So there, I guess, that's a, an urgent need which also would allow investors and industry to better understand what are then at the end the policy priorities. But having said that, I always a bit afraid to say that because it's a huge task. But just f for you as an example, it's ridiculous that the Swiss government subsidize promotions of meat with public money, whereas we then also use public money to somehow deal with a non non-communicable no. non non diseases. So I guess the policy coherence is, is a basis for all of us here to be more reactive to the chances and the opportunities the sector faces also. Yeah, perhaps I can just jump in there as well. There's a very other important consideration in all this, and that's ultimate end cost for the consumer, and we have to drive that down. So I was actually on a very interesting presentation for the um, Impossible Food CEO yesterday, and he was talking about his you know, very exciting business. Uh, for those of you who don't know Impossible Foods, they have one of the market-leading plant-based burgers in the U.S., and um, I've seen substantial growth there. But the, the challenge, as he put it, was that at the present time, these alternative meats are 30 to 40 percent more expensive than your regular meat. Now, he is very confident that over time, given their much advantaged supply chain and, and labor costs in that supply chain, that they can actually produce these products at a lower cost than your traditional meat. And that will be key when we get to cost parity for the consumer to drive a further increase in penetration in these markets. Now, to, that's the first step. The other key consideration here is regulation and the importance of regulation here because it's all very well getting to a cost parity, but then what happens when some of these scaled meat producers you know, in free market economies decide to lower prices and undercut to maintain market share? And that's going to be the challenge here and where regulation really needs to step up in the, um, to support the sustainable goals. I think there are a lot of uh, conflict of interest be, uh, be between the different stakeholders. And Martin, you wanted to add something on, on, on that. So yeah, I just w one point. You're right with the cost, but I'm not sure whether the race downwards is the right path. We should also consider that many goods are not at their right costs. So there is a, a lot of discussion around true cost accounting and that stuff. And that's very interesting. It's, it's mainly driven from industry and science is struggling a bit because of methodological reasons. It's very difficult to, to assess these true costs, but I guess a true cost lens is key. Of course, then we, we face the problem that food might be more expensive, but maybe the wrong food is more expensive and the right one gets comparably or relatively cheaper. That's exactly the true cost accounting. How much is costs production of a protein, as an example? And Stefano, you have as well your your opinion on on uh, on on a true measurement because this is as well the tricky part. How can we compare that, and what are the the real costs behind? But there are a couple of points I would like to to raise. The first one is, uh, I think, uh, um, discussing about true cost. Uh, one of the first time I've, I've seen uh, uh, that recently, in, uh, in September, IMF published a, a research on, uh, about the true cost of, of emission. And I think it's, uh, it's quite interesting because they estimate that the impact is roughly 7-8% of GDP. So we are underestimating some, all the externalities that are produced by a, such an amount, which is, which is incredible. 
Second aspect is that uh, as investor, it's always not very easy to find uh, to find data, to find the right uh, numbers to measure and to invest. And I quite like appreciate the work that Fair does, uh, and um, because it allows us to to better select and integrate additional additional measure. But would be also very interesting to be able to to measure the the ratio between the emission and proteins that are produced. So what is for a certain company the ratio for the, the amount of emission that it creates and the proteins that is able to distribute to the society. So that's something that can potentially drive a lot of in, interesting investment for, for us and to improve also the uh, the state of uh, of the food system as a whole. Of course, as it has been said, we need uh, frameworks, we need uh, help from the academia, we need uh, uh, governance, clear policies, because otherwise for the company it's also difficult to invest in the long run. If, so these are maybe a few thoughts. Mm -hmm. And this goes actually as well into our next topic about distribution, because even if you have an ecologic production of avocados in, in Mexico and then you start flying that around the globe, is not really, uh, let's say, uh, efficient in terms of emissions and, and other aspects. So um, I would like to address the current challenges as well on, on, on the food distribution itself. One is, one is distribution itself, but as well is, is the, the, the waste. We, we heard at the beginning one third of the food that is produced is not being eaten. So it is it, the emission and, and the use of resources, but it's just rotten away. So what are there the, what are the numbers and, and, and the current challenges you see? Who would like to answer first? I think this is something for everybody. Sam? I think we've touched on the main challenges in food distribution already. The way I see it is convoluted, complex supply chains producing excessive amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. And like you say, there ends um, the waste problem as well. The two are substantial and need to be improved. And perhaps I can provide you some examples of exciting companies in our eyes that are disrupting those established models. So um, first, uh, an example, a European company that I'm sure you've all heard of, possibly some of you have used, but HelloFresh. So HelloFresh are actually the largest provider of meal kits in the world. Um, it's quite an interesting business model from a waste perspective and also carbon emissions. So firstly, if you think about um, the waste perspective, so the business model is established on, on meal kits, so you will order exactly what you need for a meal. And thereby, uh, I'm sure you've all been in a situation where you've gone to the supermarket, picked up a basket of goods, taken them home, you get to the end of the week and actually there's a large amount of unused food left in the fridge that goes in the bin. Um, which will then go on to waste and produce methane potentially. Um, you know, if you're ordering a meal kit, it's, they give you the exact quantities of food that you need to have your meal with no leftover waste. So it's quite a powerful dynamic there. And the company has some very interesting data on the amount of waste they can save. So that's the first point. Second, just on greenhouse gas emissions. So again, I touched on it earlier, but the traditional supermarket distribution model, if you think about it, typically it'll go from the producer of the food into perhaps a regional distribution center, then onto an urban warehouse, and then distributed out to all the various supermarkets um, throughout a city or urban area, street corners. You contrast that with a business model such as HelloFresh, whereby the suppliers are supplying direct into a centralized warehouse that then goes out direct to the consumer in a round robin efficient delivery format. And so the carbon emissions from the whole process are substantially less. So actually the company's done a lot of analysis on this and claim that the carbon emissions from a HelloFresh meal are actually 25% less than the same meal purchased from a traditional supermarket, which is, I thought, quite a compelling argument. Um, the other great example to use is uh, the role of the internet and digital consumer platforms. So there's a very exciting business model in China called Pinduo Duo. For those of you who aren't aware, Pinduoduo is the second largest um, digital consumer platform in China. And they have a very large role to play in food. And the business model is essentially what we call D2C, so direct to consumer. So it's essentially getting food from the farm to the fork in the most efficient manner by uh, connecting the food producer with the consumer and thereby reducing the whole complex 
uh, supply chain that is inherent in a traditional supermarket business model, again, with substantial savings around food waste and carbon emissions. Let's talk about freshness of food. I think this is a really uh, difficult topic. For on the one hand, it's really that something gets rotten, and the other hand, or the other topic is that it's not accepted anymore by customers. If you look what has been thrown away in Switzerland, it's it's still very very good food. Uh, so maybe Sophia, what do you think? How much is just consumer driven, and how much is really a lack of an efficient distribution of food until it uh, is, is is getting delivered to the end customer? Um, <clears throat> I think this question. My, my first answer would be, it depends where we are. And I think when we speak about uh, food loss and food waste, it's really important to distinguish that when we go to low-income low markets, it is about food loss. So it's more the food that is lost before it gets to the consumer-facing companies or to the consumer's plates. And when we speak about high-income countries, it really is at the consumer point, and that's waste. So I think in high-income countries, we still have a huge role to play as consumers in being more mindful of the food we choose, how we choose it, how we process it, how we eat it, of not buying more food that we need, of not going to the buffet and just adding to our plates. So the consumer has a more important role. Uh, at the same time, companies can do more to give the right portions, to si signal to the consumer. In low and middle income markets, there's much more work that needs to be done kind of from, from the farm to the manufacturer and kind of that set that the, those stages of the value chain. And that's where we see a lot of innovations that need to happen to avoid that loss. That loss is also much higher when it comes to fresh products such as fruits and vegetables and animal proteins. So I think that there are some really interesting innovations that are happening on kind of how to have the right crates to transport food, how to make fruits and vegetables last longer. I think like a company like Appeal is doing fantastic work uh, in that sense. There's also a lot of efficiencies that can happen. I know we worked with some of the uh, meat distributors and producers and we're looking at them, looking at their own value chain and making sure that they're reducing emissions, they're reducing water use, uh, and they're avoiding any of that loss that can happen. But I think it, I mean, as it touches different points of the value chain in different regions, it really requires a lot of coordinated actions between the consumers, the companies, and the policymakers. And that's where, again, I think it is important for policymakers to, to really be thinking a little bit with more foresight and to accompany uh, the changes that need to happen at a company level and at the consumer level to give the right signals not only to the companies and to the consumers uh, so that we reduce some of that uh, food loss and waste that is happening throughout the food value chain. Mm -hmm. Yes, you just mentioned a peel science. I think this is a good example. Uh, they, they, that's a plant-based peel they're producing for fruits and, and vegetables, and I think they they double up the, the duration of freshness of, of food. So yeah. in terms of distribution, that's a, that's a really a success story. But uh, the other point is, as well, you mentioned, it only works if all stakeholders in this value chain are coordinated to, to some extent. And and that's why it really needs rather a food industry. It needs, it, it needs a, a food system. And for that, I think Martin uh, ETH has developed this Food World System Center. That's a great word. So can you elaborate a little bit more on this center, its collaboration, purpose, and, and, and current projects and focuses? Happy to do so. It's the World Food System Center, but no worries. I'm sorry. It's just too many words in a row. But it's actually, um, the idea behind is to connect research which is linked to the food system, and we take a very broad food system approach. So that means we start at the environmental base. So we have a lot of groups m which are member at our center, which is a competent center uh, within ETH Zurich. And they work on, on issues like soil, soil health, climate change, and so on. We go along the value chain over agricultural production, food processing, food technology, biotechnology, food safety aspects, all the way down to health. And what we do, we try to be kind of a, an umbrella over all these different 
research groups doing focused research in their area. And we tried to translate this more in a, into a system perspective. Try to support our members in collaborating with each other to share different perspectives on one or two key challenges of the food system. And we try to translate the research findings into products which are more accessible also for larger society. So that you and I also understand what people do in terms of vaccinations for antibiotic reduction, for example. Um, on the other hand, we also link our research groups with, with industry in order to try to come up with research approaches which have an application orientation, which have um, also there from the start on a shared view on the challenge to be tackled through research. That allows us to, to have a more kind of participatory way of, of addressing uh, challenges. And just maybe one or two examples of, of projects we, we currently are, are doing or planning to do. One example is we have a flagship project on alternative proteins. It's within one chair which works on, on sustainable food processing. And they actually try to use microalgae or insects to substitute protein for food, that's mainly the algae track, or substitute protein intake for feed, that's mainly the insect track. And there we add then different elements. We connect their research with um, animal nutrition research, trying to understand what do these insects have an impact on the meat quality, on the egg quality, on the color of the egg yellow, which is might sound ridiculous, but it's very It's again the consumer, to, yes, the acceptance of the know, consumer. That's one of the pillars of that project, that we have consumer acceptance and consumer um, um, response to these products already included in the research at an early stage. Um, another aspect is then to really assess with a multi-indicator approach, the sustainability of these alternatives and compare them to existing, existing products. And of course, foremost, and that's the center of the, the chair's interest, is to improve the efficiency of the process as such. And there, there are many kind of linkages with industry also uh, possible. Another example is we, and that's more than on the ag side, is trying to better understand how to build resilience, maybe main, mainly climate resilience of smallholder farmers to, you know, to changing climates, to shocks and so on. There also we try to gather all the actors of a value chain around the table and participatorily assess, analyze what are the pain points towards resilience in that. So we really try to bridge or to embrace complexity of the food system, not to say, okay, it's too complex, we just look at one or two elements, but really try to promote uh, a more inter and transdisciplinary approach to, to, do, to these challenges, and then translate them or connect them to, to industry in order to also support then uh, a possible application at early stage or, or later stage. And there, maybe one sentence more, we are happy that we also are a member of the Swiss Food Nutrition Valley. I guess that's an initiative which has quite some potential to increase this collaboration between industry, the big players are in Switzerland, that's a, an opportunity also for our ecosystem here, but also connect them to startups and have or build uh, an environment where innovation can be supported. Because I guess it's, it's really new technologies put at the right place, in the right spot, have a huge potential. Mm -hmm. um, we see that in, in many different contexts, also, also in Project in Africa, where we try to close nutrient cycles. Because in, in, in many urban areas, majority of the food still comes from the hinterland. So you produce food, you deliver it to the city, it's, it's wasted, it's, you, you, you have human 
consuming it and you have human waste also and these nutrients are brought back through innovations let's say human based uh, fertilizers back to the to the production site and with that we can also support kind of or decrease the dependency of, of external fertilizers as well. So we work at different stages, different yeah. elements. And so I think it's really important to see that the role of science is not just, let's say, research and developing new technologies. It's much more, let's say, a consulting or even a mediation role between the different stakeholders in facilitating how to improve the overall chain. And uh, maybe, um, Chris, you can... I think uh, the whole idea came as well out of, of, uh, of as well uh, in collaboration with ETH. So is, how did that happen and what is the current collaboration with ETH? Yeah, so we're, we're in, the, the official designation is an ETH spin-off. So uh, uh, let's say part of the technology uh, we developed at ETH. And um, so for us, it was a vector that allowed us to scale really, really fast. Our first production was in uh, something called the pilot plant of the ETH. Um, so we basically get uh, part of the expensive equipment that you need for what we do uh, to rent and uh, scale up. So I think the institutions play a really, really large role in the sense of that they, if they give you the access, if, if they give you the opportunity to commercialize something and to run really fast, uh, you can develop. And um, in the beginning, when capital is scarce, you need a proof of concept that is extremely valuable. So we not only got the equipment, but we also got a 150K grant uh, to basically get started. And this allowed us to go to market. And when you're in the market and you have investor meetings, it's a pretty strong statement. If they're like, can we try a prototype? You're really like, yes, here you go. And by the way, if you want to pick up a pack uh, on your way, out uh, or on your way home there's a supermarket or there's a restaurant where you can try it so i think first it needs to uh, spark uh, entrepreneurship and then the second thing which is now ongoing is obviously um, when we push the boundaries of technology uh, there's a lot of great research and science done in a lot of institutions worldwide and then it's about for us as a company creating a link with the leading scientists in each part because if you look at uh, you want to do a replicate uh, or do a better stake uh, you need fat, you need collagen, you need uh, fibrosity, you need a lot of different things, which is a lot of different technologies. And um, there is probably not just one uh, school of thought uh, that is interesting, but it's interesting to pick wherever the industry or the leading science experts are and then to work with them. So a lot of uh, great things come out of many institutions, uh, such as the ETH, and so we do have a, a PhDs, uh, master thesis, bachelor thesis, as well as concrete research projects. So in the algae project, for example, we're also involved. So we then sort of, like, like on, on the computer side, you would say like an API, right? You dock into institutions and see what is interesting and what you can actually commercialize then into product. Thank you very much. And there's a follow-up question maybe to Sophia. How does now FAIR initiative fit into this, into this picture? That's maybe a very general question, but uh, uh, yeah. on this example, where, where does it fit in? So I think when, when FAIR was launched five years ago, it came out of a realization that there was a lot of, like that the food system was very complex, there was a lot of information, but that there wasn't really an organization that was providing information in the language that investors need to be able to integrate that information into their investment decision making. And while the ESG industry uh, was growing and there was a lot of kind of digestible information for investors to be able to navigate other industries, such as the energy industry, it, the, everything that related to the global food system, it was like impossible for investors to distinguish what was good practice from what was uh, poor performance. So that is exactly what FAIR does. So we are an investor network and we provide that investor network with different tools to equip investors to, inter to take more informed investment decisions. Those tools include, um, we do a lot of data and research on companies. We, do, we also provide comparative tools that allow investors to understand kind of which companies, how companies compare to each other. Um, we produce thematic research and we also facilitate some of these collaborative engagements that I mentioned between the companies and the investors so that investors can use their collective influence to have a dialogue with the companies 
and encourage them to improve their behavior. Uh, we work very collaboratively with also with academia, with uh, entrepreneurs like Christophe. We want to make sure that we're kind of like co collating different sorts of information and then providing that to an investor audience that has a strong appetite to navigate what are the ESG risks and opportunities in a sector that is so complex. Um, so that's what we've been doing uh, and it it seems that uh, since we started, and we started with a handful of members, we've grown to having now 300 investor members with over 45 trillion in combined assets. So it seems that from starting to a place where investors didn't even know that food system was a term, uh, now we have investors that are like really advanced in their thinking and that use our benchmarking tools on a daily basis to understand okay, how do I distinguish which companies are the leaders, which are the laggards, and how I can use my influence to, to enable a food system transition. Thank you very much. And I think there was a launch of a, of a new food index as well. Uh, yes. You mentioned. What is, the, what is the purpose and what does it measure and what is it all about? Yes, yeah, so uh, this is uh, our new protein producer index that is being launched today. So it is really fresh out of the oven. If you go to our website, you'll be the first to be able to see the full report and the new assessment of companies. So basically, this is a benchmark of the 60 largest companies in the world that are protein producers of all five different main categories of protein. And it allows investors to compare, I mean, which are the companies that are kind of being ahead of the game, which are the companies that are staying behind, and also to understand which are the ESG risks and opportunities within these companies. So it is very informative, and it also allows kind of like that transparent information to be shared with the world. And also, it also gives a little bit of competition between the companies, because once you're part of a benchmark and you see that your competitors are, some of them are ahead of you, it kind of encourages the companies themselves to aspire to do more. So uh, I think it kind of influences the industry in different ways while providing the right information for investors to take more informed decisions when allocating their capital. So I do encourage you to, uh, if you're interested, to go and look at uh, the latest assessment and to see which are the companies that are doing their homework and which are the ones mm -hmm. that are still staying reactive and kind of pretending that the world hasn't changed. <laughs> so they become comparable and at the end it's, it's, it's similar to a rating of the different companies in that sense. Exactly. Maybe let's, let's continue now on, on the investment side. I think um, there are a lot of new technologies developed and will be developed. Uh, there are big players, so there's as well, a, let's say, a huge range of investments in the liquid space, so uh, on, on the stock exchange, but as well in private markets. So Sam, maybe what is your investment approach to running this food system, uh, uh, food value chain portfolio for FCOM? And uh, what is the focus and how to do construct the overall portfolio? Sure, so going back to what we said at the start of the discussion, we try and think about and structure the investment universe into the three key segments that you see on the screen. So reading left to right, you've got the upstream section of agriculture. Um, so focusing on companies who are innovating in the areas of seeds, so increasing yields, improving yields, precision agriculture, uh, livestock management, uh, fertilizers. Then in the middle section, so distribution, so thinking about companies involved in packaging um, of the product, transportation of the food, um, marketing of that food to the consumer, uh, particularly on the sustainable side, and obviously waste produced in the whole process. And then on the consumer facing business, on, on the consumer facing downstream side, looking at those companies that are offering sustainable food options. So just to give you, I mean, there's there's so many examples in each of these different sub segments, but to just give you some innovative company examples, um, Precision Agriculture, for instance. Um, there's some really interesting companies out there doing things such as GPS positioning technology for combine harvesters and tractors. So actually um, helping farmers um, mow their field, uh, harvest their crops in the most efficient manner, thereby obviously reducing emissions and maximizing yields. 
livestock management, very interesting companies. For instance, a UK company called Genus, focusing on optimizing genetics of animals, animal protein. So maximizing um, yields out of dairy, uh, beef, and pork, and doing that in a way that actually requires the animals to consume less, and so therefore optimizing that side of things. Um, fertilizers, high quality seed. And in terms of packaging, the focus there is very much on those sustainable packaging solutions. So for instance, cardboard over plastic, or those um, that operate in a established, developed circular economy. So those such as aluminum cans, perhaps, over PET bottles. Um, on the sustainable food side, so many different exciting company business models. We've touched on a few today, so obviously alternative proteins is an incredibly exciting space, both on the meat side and the milk. And we've got innovations in the restaurant space, so companies that are working with restaurants to help them reduce their water consumption and reduce their food waste. Um, companies then also in nutrition and health that are focused on healthy eating and clean label products and essentially improving the nutrients in our food. Um, and many, many more examples uh, that perhaps we don't have time to go into now. But uh, suffice to say, there's innovation going on throughout the whole value chain and creates opportunities uh, for us as investors, but most importantly, um, gives us hope that we can improve the sustainability within the food chain. In terms of access, you know uh, that there are new technologies on the private equity side and then the liquid side. So you're saying in terms of already established firms, there's a lot and sufficient firms that are accessible and by investors that do not want to take the liquid side of, of, of the investment. Mm. It's a really good question. So I mean, so they're clearly the, the innovators, the disruptors that are new to the market today are clearly going to play an essential role over the next decade in forming um, and improving the sustainability of food chains. So, um, yeah, alternative proteins being been a prime example of that. On the flip side, where the uh, liquid equity space does play a role is uh, it gives us access and engagement with some of the largest corporates in the space in the world, and they are impacting the today, you know, the important carbon footprint, global emission, waste, all the issues we talked about today. So to give you a prime example, for instance, uh, Deer & Co, so the world's largest manufacturer of um, agricultural equipment, so combine harvesters, tractors, um, so ex excluding China, uh, in 2020, over a million tractors were sold. So, you know, to give you a deer, deer has a $2 billion research and development budget, revenues of $35 billion. Um, you know, if they can improve the technology in their combine harvesters to improve the, the yield in harvesting crops on that global scale, that is a massive incremental benefit that we can achieve today. And so, us as investors into those companies, um, you know, gives us an opportunity to engage and support them in their journey in terms of improving sustainability. Okay, thank you very much. Now let's move to the financing needs of a new technology. I think that you just mentioned alternative protein. So, Chris, you mentioned it was, let's say, at the beginning easy as a as a as a ETF spin -off, a ETH spin off, but then to find the right and and uh, investors with the long-term horizon, because I think a new technology is not just investing and then having a, an IPO after three, four years, it's much more longer term, and it is much more important to have the right investors than the wrong. So what, what were your experiences, and, and, and especially as well, from where did you get your financing, if, if I may? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good question, because in the end, we say we want to fundamentally transform something, and typically there's quite a bit of effort required to do that. And that's maybe then requires investors with a longer time horizon. So I, th I think what we saw pretty early on was investors saying, well, can we get uh, an exit after four years or five years? And you look at the technology stack and you go like, no, this is not going to work out. So I think for us, it was uh, really important to find investors that uh, back our long term vision and mission uh, of commercializing, uh, let's say, the cutting edge of technology that you have. So I think it's very important for, from the investor side, I think, to distinguish versus there's some real value creation versus marketing, maybe. Um, because I think in the end, the value creation will come out of the technology and the vector that that technology gives. And I think that we're just starting to explore. So I, I think for a young startup as ours, um, coming more from the technical side, it, it was very key 
to find these backers uh, that say, yes, we're, we're, we're having a 10 year, 15 year time horizon um, to really grow something and uh, not just need, needing the quick exit. And I think that's the fundamental shift if you want to say you want to have impact on the capital side. Um, I, I think it's also very much about being there for the transition and the transformatory part and not just quick and easy wins. But may I ask, I mean, there are a lot of uh, developments and startup uh, uh, support of, of Swiss investors. Did you find the majority of your capital needed from the typical Swiss venture capital and, and, and startup investors, or how, how was that distributed? Yeah, so I, th I think we tried to find a healthy balance on, on the cap table. So we do have, uh, let's say, early backers, angel investors, which is mostly Swiss, uh, like family offices, etc., uh, which were extremely helpful, who have that long-term horizon. And then I think it's more international focus or sector uh, and focused investors who then also have the longer time horizons. And you see then sometimes, let's say, more local VCs or VCs in general, like... The, that, that really love that uh, quick turnaround and uh, want the three, four, or five year exit uh, written into the shareholders agreement, which then doesn't uh, work out with, the, with, with what we want to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, we found them. Um, the lead investors for the Series A were Blue Horizon out of Switzerland, but I think very global sector focus. And then uh, Vorwerk Ventures out of Germany, who also uh, are used to those longer term horizons. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, we can, could continue to deepen all the topics for hours, but we are almost at the end of this panel. So before maybe open up for questions from the audience, I would like to ask all of you one minute question, or let's say a one minute answer to my question. At the beginning we said uh, the food system is broken. So in, in your opinion, what are the two, three most crucial aspects that need to happen in the next two, three, four years that we start healing this system? Maybe we start with Stefano. Okay. But I think that the elephant in the room today was policymaker and government. If you think that the agriculture and the food system was responsible for 30% of emission and it was barely touched at COP26, that's completely insane. I would second Stefano's point, it's, it's regulatory focus has to improve. So whilst there were some encouraging developments at the COP, for instance, uh, a large number of countries committing to methane emission reductions um, by 2030 of over 30%, obviously there were some notable emissions in there um, in country terms in terms of China and India, but nonetheless that's a positive step, but to do that and not address the focus on food specifically, given its contribution to methane, um, is, is, is not acceptable and needs to improve. And there's so many examples through all the different parts of the value chain that we've discussed today where regulation um, done right can have a positive impact. So for instance, salmon farming, you know, we've seen the impact um, in Norway of tightening regulation around antibiotic use, use of antimicrobials, managing sea lice. You know, th there's some regulation has to play a key role. Thank you, Sophia. So staying in, uh, in a similar tone, I do think that the regulatory environment is staying a little bit behind the game of how fast the industry is moving. So regulators need to work in harmony with the technologies that we're seeing and also provide a, a, a kind of a, a more robust set of standards for investors to actually follow that and also for companies to do the right thing. So when we speak about pathways to 1.5 degrees. We have a very clear pathway for the energy sector. We need that same pathway uh, for the food and agricultural as, as a sector uh, so that investors can hold, follow that pathway, companies can follow that pathway, and I also want to see consumers being able to get that nudge and have the information to vote with their wallets every time they pick a food choice. So again, the enabling environment needs to happen also through, through policy change. So what you're basically saying, there's really a lack of, let's say, a regulatory framework or a governance where all the stakeholders can move forward, not, not only internationally, but as well intranationally. If we see the example of Martin that uh, was, was talking about subsidies on one side of the agriculture and on the other side of, uh, of, uh, of the health side. So 
That's yeah. the main issue. So, yeah, so I think some countries, that, like we see some countries that are more advanced in the regulatory environment, more forward looking, some are still a bit stuck, but I think internationally, we need a, a pathway for the industry that is clear and that we're using public money in a way that is clear, that we're subsidizing uh, the innovative, the nature positive change. And I feel that there's still, that pathway is not clear. We are actually at FAIR, we're doing a lot of work in kind of using the investor voice to ask for that pathway to be developed and to be made public because we need it. But how close and how realistic is this to happen? Well, it happened for the energy industry, and we've seen that 10 years ago we didn't expect uh, electric cars to be where they are today, so I still think that uh, I'm optimistic. I think that it is possible. We need to ask for it now so that we hopefully see it come, uh, yeah, co come to light in the next few years, and that you know, th this has to be the, the decade of action is already <laughs> far, far advanced, so I, I still think we can do it. Just very, very shortly, there are roughly 700 billion of subsidies that goes in the wrong direction. So let's start in taking these and putting in the work in the right direction, subsidizing sectors and companies that make sense from an environmental and nutritional point of view. Okay. Martin? I um, agree to what you all said. I guess it's a regulatory issue, but the challenge here is we have we have multiple indicators to tackle, and that's a bit different than to the energy sector. I, what I said, I guess it's policy coherence, which leads to then a more um, binding regulatory framework, but what I also think, and when looking at these 17 goals, I guess goal number 17 is key here, it's partnership. So I guess we need to collaborate much closer than in other sectors through the food system, because food system is for us, everyone here, every day we have countless decisions on food, much more than we have in other sectors. So for me, it's the partnership, it's a binding regulatory framework and trying to, to make a step out of voluntary guidelines. So far in the food system, we only know voluntary guidelines. And that's nonsense. It doesn't help. It gives an indication, but it doesn't help. So we need something more binding, which then allows to, to really um, invest the money which is wrongly allocated currently in, in innovations which really have a FSA. And consumers, we are part of it. So it's all also our own responsibility in a way. So look at your fridge tonight and see what you have for lunch, yes. So, uh, Chris? Yeah, so for me, it's, uh, or for us, it's our, our, our goal or our challenge uh, to execute against what I said in the beginning. So it's the better product, the better price, and more efficient at it. And so for us, it's the ambition by 2030 to deliver on that, and that being not just in, here in Switzerland, not in Europe, but all over the world. So that's our mission and that's what we execute against. Okay, thank you very much for your valuable contribution. I think it was really educative and uh, almost as well a wake-up call of what we shall do and uh, what we can do as individuals. So I would like us now open up the discussion. Or are there some questions from the audience? Yes? The microphone is coming. In a Thank you so much for a very interesting panel. My question is around engagement and, and ESG information for food corporations, multinationals, um, that, as you were saying, move, move the needle in, in this topic. Um, so my question is, do you think that these corporations really have a connection between the claims that they make or, the, for example, the net zero commitments that they make or the ESG reporting that they make? Between, if, there, if there is a connection between that and their, uh, really what is driving the profits for them, do they really understand how much would it cost for them to shift their production to, to more sustainable uh, value chains? That's one question. And the other question is like, if you look at somebody like a big um, food corporation that, ha that is active in so many ingredients and, and you know, crops and 
um, different proteins. And then you get one ESG rating that summarizes all that complexity. How do you make sure that you don't lose all that complexity in the process? And if there is, in your perspective, any way to really engage uh, with these corporations and acknowledge that uh, you know, every supply chain, every single country is, is unique, and there are so many, so many issues that need to be addressed, and, and probably just you know, what, one ESG rating and, and having a fund that has a good uh, portfolio of, of companies is, is just too simple, no? for that complexity. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Who would like to answer? Um, so, I mean, I think I can start, and I'm sure um, there's other ideas in the room, but I think the first thing I would say is I think companies are understanding more and more that some of the issues that we mention are not about morality. It is about financial materiality. Um, taking a risk such as being part, having deforestation in your supply chain is a, uh, it's a material risk. It is not just about if, you're, if you love trees or not. It is about uh, a reputational issue and it's about investors actually uh, eventually even wanting to separate from you if you don't take action. So I think that the conversation has moved from morality and doing good and responsibility CSR to financial materiality. I think that would be my, my first um, uh, take. I think second, it is you mentioned a very important point. That is, one thing is to make a, a claim and to come and say, I will do this. I think what is really important is about setting specific targets and having the mechanisms to monitor progress. And that's why I think for, for us, we consider that that dialogue with companies is quite efficient because it usually runs for three to five years. And we are actually asking the companies to monitor every six months and every year what their progress is. And it allows their shareholders to have that transparent information. So that's quite, a, quite an efficient mechanism to do so. Uh, then in terms of ESG rating, I agree sometimes there's uh, oversimplification with companies that have really complex supply chains and uh, a global presence. So they are not perfect. But I think the more we are get consolidating different information and the more investors have access to different impartial information they can consolidate, the more it gives them a picture of what are the key risks and what are the opportunities, what are the red flags. So as everything, it is a bit like a model. It doesn't paint the whole reality, but at least it gives you a proxy for what, what, it mean, what that company means, how it compares to others. So it is as good as we have now. And the more we encourage disclosure from companies, the more we will have better information for those ESG ratings. So again, it is about disclosure and transparency. Maybe on the composition of rating, I can add a few thoughts. And uh, I completely agree that ESG rating as itself is a, is a wide simplification. What we encourage internally to do, what we suggest to do to, to Sam and to all the other colleagues that focus on investment is not to look at the final ESG rating, but look at what's behind. Because every ESG rating is a composition, composition of different aspects, different KPIs, policies, outcome, controversies. So, Try to look at all the different uh, the different uh, sum of these uh, different components of this sum to be uh, to be able to really judge and have an idea of what what are the risks. Then we have to communicate, and then uh, the SG rating is a simplified tool. But we are aware it's uh, it's really a, a simplification. Yeah, maybe just to follow up on that, I think in the end it's very simple, right? On the investor side, you can have potentially a huge tail risk if the technology stack that the company that you invest in performs poor, poorly. And the most promising sign I actually saw out of IFRS uh, that they're now s setting up a standards committee that will basically re uh, have reporting guidelines. And then I would ask you investors, hold the management of the companies that you invest as accountable for the environmental information they provide through then hopefully with a standard reporting through IFRS and challenge if they commit fraud and don't report the right way as you do if they would on the financial side because the risk is as big as the financial risk. That's exactly the point of non-financial disclosure that is now really a, a big topic uh, going forward. Thank you very much. And I think there was a second question from the audience. Yes.
Yeah, thank you. Without affecting morality or ethical aspect, or uh, without looking to affecting ethical aspect, uh, we are uh, concerning uh, focusing on vegetables. We are not focusing on human being and public health. And uh, there is challenges and opportunities. But opportunities for invest business, we can do it in vegetables, flowers. It depends where we are. Here in Geneva, our flowers coming from, from the airport, because coming from other parts of the world. Yes. But if we are more focusing on food, we are affecting food sufficiency and food sovereignty. There, where they are. That, but with two dilemmas, how you can uh, elaborate more. Thank you very much. I think this is really what everybody of ourselves can do on a daily basis, just, just uh, out of our door. And somebody would like to comment as well on that? or. Yeah, I, I tried to make it, um, or I, I'm, I'm on the same page as you, you are. We have to have an eye on the key actors of the food system, and these are producers and consumers. And then in between, we have agents which help us to make the connection between those two as efficient and less pollutant as possible. And one way, of course, is to increase the, uh, or to, to shorten the value chains from producers to consumers. And that can be in a gener geographical way, where we have just proximity as one, one element, but it can be also in terms of how the value chain or the network is structured. So it's, it's not that we, or I, I don't think that a sole focus on proximity geographically is the solution, but the solution is that we better understand the value of food across the entire um, system. And there, I guess that's where then also a food system policy plays a role, which allows then to empower the different food system actors. So that's a bit my thought, what, what you just shared. But maybe, yeah, I'm not sure whether I answered the question. No, I think that's exactly what you said. I mean, the two main players or participants, that's the producers and the consumers. And the consumers, that's us. Whether it's proximity or our behavior on a daily basis, how we treat that, without uh, waiting until there is a governmental framework on an international basis, I think it's really on a daily basis what we can change on ourselves. And I think uh, with that, again, I would like to thank you very much in the name of EFG for your contribution and your attendance. I think now it's lunchtime, so bon appétit. And I wish you a good day and a good continuation of this conference. Thank you very much. <laughs>